here is uh, Christopher Hitchens. This is in a debate with Frank Turek, uh, who is, uh, I'm sorry? Right, who is a student of Norman Geisler. So he would be a strong evidentialist, anti-reformed. Gave a standard, what I would call William Lane Craig presentation in his opening. How many of you are familiar with William Lane Craig? Only guy I know has done more debates than I have. Uh, seriously, uh, he is. Um, well known. He is, we really represent the, the opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to apologetics. And what I mean by that is the reason we differ so much is our theology differs so much. We are, we are I think, one of the strongest examples of how theology does determine your apologetics, whether you're going at it the right way or not. I hope I'm going at it the right direction. I believe he goes at it the opposite direction. But the point is for Dr. Craig, uh, I had a friend who was at a conference at uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary, not Southern Seminary, Southern Evangelical Seminary, which is Norman Geisler's former school, which he's no longer at. And he was manning a booth there. And Dr. Craig was standing right nearby. And he heard him say to a, a large group of young men, if you want to be involved in apologetics, stop reading so much theology, you must read more philosophy. And that's his perspective. I truly believe that for William Lane Craig, the philosophical presuppositions of his system determine his theology. And from my perspective, your theology must determine the philosophical presuppositions of your system because I think one is primary to the other. Um, but that all goes back to our theology, and our theology is very, very different. So uh, Dr. Turek had given a, a pretty much William Lane Craigish perspective. And what might that be? Before I start, I, I, I sort of need to lay this out for you. So I, I do need to cover this for you so, so you understand this. And I'm going to wake the cameraman up because I, I, need, I feel the need to become peripatetic. Anybody know what that is? Peripateo, to walk, yes. So I'm going to become peripatetic for a moment. Um, how many of you have, have, have seen a William Lane Craig debate? Okay, about half of you. Let me summarize. Um, how many of you have heard the Bonson Stein debate? About the same, same one, okay. Um, when I teach apologetics, uh, at Golden Gate, I play the debate between Gordon Stein and um, Greg Bonson. And I might, if, I can, if, I, if I've got a good enough internet connection, I might download the opening statement that I made in my debate with Dan Barker just, just to play it for you tomorrow. That might actually be faster than me summarizing things. Fundamentally, when William Lane Craig debates, here is his thesis. The preponderance of the evidence points to the greater probability of the existence of a God. Let me repeat that. The preponderance of evidence points to the greater probability of the existence of a God. Okay? That is the theism that he is defending. Now, contrast that with Greg Bonson's thesis in his debate, which was, without the Christian God, you cannot even explain why we're having a debate tonight. Therefore, the Christian God must exist. Now, those are not the same assertions. They're not the same arguments in any way. One, what, what, does, what does the William Lane Craig, what position does the William Lane Craig thesis put the unbeliever in? The judgment seat. Because you have to determine what the greater preponderance of evidence is about. But what doesn't it assert? It doesn't assert the existence of the Christian God. It exists, it asserts the existence of a God, 
And then evidently you have to somehow, once you have a God, now start comparing gods and say, well, the only God that actually ends up really working in the long term is the Christian God. And that's generally related to some kind of resurrection narrative argumentation and historiography and so on and so forth. That uh, you have the three undisputed facts of the resurrection and, and that kind of thing. So that, that's a completely different form of argumentation. To go from the greater probability of the existence of a God to the Christian God. Well, the amazing thing is what you're about to see is that Christopher Hitchens understands that. I don't know a lot of atheists that do, to be honest with you. But Christopher Hitchens does. And he catches Frank Turek and says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're leaping from a deistic God to the Christian God without seeing that there's a huge gap in between. And he's right. And it should wake us up. When, when Christopher Hitchens is right, you should go, hmm, because this is a God hater. He's wrong about a lot of things. But on this one, he happens to be right. And why is he right? Well, because I simply have to ask the question, when did the apostles ever argue that the greater, the, the, the majority of the evidence points to the greater possibility of the existence of a God? Where, where did the apostles ever argue like that? I know, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. So with that, this is only a 7 minute and 16 second clip. It's not very long. But I want you to listen to the voice of the new atheism. And I want you to, as you listen to this, what if you were in the position of the Christian debater? As you hear him speaking, do what I have to do. You know, people ask, what are you doing up there when the other guy's talking? Well, now I'm playing with my live scribe pen, and uh, <laughs> I'm going, oh, this is really cool. No. Um, I am writing things down as quickly as I possibly can. I'm trying to pay close attention. But I am, the, the term we use today is multitasking. Because part of my brain is listening and recording. And part of my brain is an analyzing argumentation to see if there's some factual error that's being made. That's going to get circled and exclamation points, stuff like that next to it. But then you know what the toughest part is? Because there's no time between segments in these debates. As soon as the other guy sits down, I'm up. In the few seconds, literally, between the end of his statement, whether it's a rebuttal statement, opening statement, whatever, and now I have to get up and respond to that. What I have to try to do is prioritize in light of what I want to do in the debate. Who do I want to reach? What are my priorities? I'm, <laughs> like I said, Dr. Basellos is much older than I am by a year. And I don't know when it happened to him, but I bet you it has, has happened. Somewhere in the 40s, I think it's because our bodies start telling us that we're not kids anymore. They don't heal the way they used to. They don't work the way they used to. You start experiencing things that you noticed with your dad, and you start feeling middle-aged. I think those are God's subtle signs to smack us upside the face and, and disabuse us of the foolish pride of life that thinks we're never going to die. And what it's done for me is I want to leave behind a body of work that will continue to speak and edify after I'm gone. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. And the amazing thing today is I can do that not just for the people in one small area. I mean, there's a reason why I have 505 videos on my YouTube site. Because people all around the world can see those things. You know what happened to our website after we started using YouTube? You can track where your hits are coming from. And when I post stuff on Islam, guess what lights up? Indonesia. Do you know what Indonesia is? Indonesia is the largest Muslim population area in the world. 
Less than 19% of the world's Muslims are Arabic. Do you know that? Less than 19%. 60% are Asian. And that's where they live. And I couldn't go into most places in Indonesia and say the things I say on that YouTube page. But I'm still saying them. And so there's this incredible ability that if, if, you, if you do it right, you don't take the shortcuts. You know, people have been saying forever, write a book on Islam, write a book. It's taken me years to get to the point where I can, I can at least do an introductory text. Because you've got to do it right. You want to you leave something that's going to have lasting value. Why is it that we can read Calvin's Institutes today and it feels like the ink will smudge? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can read from the past. It's very, very dated. It just doesn't communicate anymore. There's something about that stuff that continues to communicate. Well, I can't write like that, but I can debate in such a way that helps people. And that's what I want to do. I want to leave that kind of of body of work that will edify people. You start looking past yourself at a certain point in your life. And I'm, I'm, well, at least you're supposed to, I think. Anyways, I'm not sure what I had to do with Hitchens. I probably had a point there someplace. But anyways, let's, uh, let's take a look and listen to Christopher Hitchens. How would you respond uh, to what he has to say uh, here? And only uh, three or four perhaps 5,000 years ago, heaven decides this is enough of that. Oh. It's time for an intervention. Oh. And the best way to do it would be in the most primitive part. Let's go back to the beginning. That happens to be, by the way, the main part I want you to hear, listen to. When, you, when he gets right to the end, when he starts talking about that, I'm going to ask you how you'd respond to this, because it is his most compelling argument. I want, you, I want, I want to know how you answer it. Reason? Common sense, decency, ordinary decency rebels against this kind of mind-forged manacle, however charmingly or humorously it's expressed. But hell exists in the minds of several people I've spoken to just today on this campus in the, in the intervals of, uh, of other conversations. Uh, the, for them, it's real, and I don't say that it's not. But what I want to show is that it can, if it does exist, nonetheless be abolished like many other mind-forged manacles and man-made tyrannies that confront us. And in fact, that this belief in a supreme and unalterable tyranny is the oldest enemy of our species, the oldest enemy of our intellectual freedom and our moral autonomy, and must be met, and must be challenged, and must be overthrown. I want to argue for nothing less than that. There is no valid or coherent or consistent argument that would not work if it comes to that for the existence of any god. Now I notice it was a, by a slight work of illusion, a bit of uh, tap dancing there that Dr. Turek went from uh, being a deist to a theist and then from being a theist to a Christian. Now I know he does not believe in the existence of the sun god Ra. I'm practically certain he doesn't believe in the existence of Zeus. If you'll pick up a copy of my Portable Atheist, a selection of the finest writings by non-believers uh, down the years, and just turn to the three pages where Mencken, H.L. Mencken, lists the easiest to name 3,000 gods that used to be worshipped and that no longer are held to exist by anybody, uh, you'll spare me the trouble of reading them out. Um, no, he thinks he do doesn't just know, Dr. Turek, that there is a god. He knows which one is the right one from a potentially infinite list, actually from a list that's as long as the number of people there are or have ever been in the human species, because if you ever argue with a theist or a deist, as I do every day, you'll find they all believe in a god of their very own. Indeed, they often say a personal god. Indeed, they often say a personal savior. So out of, out of what are we reifying a concept that applies to all of us? Out of nothing but wish thinking and nonsense and fear and ignorance, and above all, and I'm not quitting on this point, servility. Everyone in this room is an atheist. Everyone can name a God in which they do not believe. Let them advance the case that the one in which they believe is the superior one. Let Dr. Torek be the first person I've ever met to do that convincingly this evening, and I will show him due respect. I don't think the task can actually be undertaken. There is no totalitarian solution to this problem. There is no big brother in the sky. 
It is a horrible idea that there is somebody who owns us, who makes us, who supervises us, waking and sleeping, who knows our thoughts, who can convict us of thought crime, who can do thought crime just for what we think, uh, who can judge us while we sleep for things that might occur to us in our dreams, who can create us sick, as apparently we are, and then order us on pain of eternal torture to be well again. Th to demand this, to wish this to be true, is to wish to live as an abject slave. It is a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing, in my submission, that we now have enough information, enough intelligence, and I hope enough intellectual and moral courage to say that this ghastly proposition is founded on a lie and to celebrate that fact. And I invite you to join me in doing so. Thank you. From this, says the th turn away from that, these incredible, majestic, awe-inspiring thoughts say that this, think about the burning bush instead. Think about the trivial miracles witnessed by sheep herding uh, peasants in Bronze Age Palestine. And think about the debt that they, they feel that we should incur for their sins. It was stated by Dr. Tore that the sins of these people, the transgressions of these people, and the debt they owe their creator bind all of us as sinners. What a shame we're not perfect. What a shame there's nothing we can do about it. What a shame we're created already in prison and have to earn our emancipation. I tell you again, this is servility to the ultimate power. Now, there, we, there are people in this audience much better equipped than I to say that there is so far nothing in our natural world to move away from the cosmological. There is nothing in our natural world, the globe we live on, that cannot be explained by random mutation combined with evolution by natural selection. Nothing works without that assumption. Everything works with it. There are lots of things that remain to be decided. But it's not a theory, or not just one. It does work, it is operational, it doesn't require a prime mover. Let me think, uh, just give me that amount of time. Suppose we've only been around for 75,000 years. Monotheism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, shows up, what, four or 5,000 years ago the most. So if you give me my most microscopically small assumption of human existence, for at least 70,000 years, heaven watches as the human species is born, dies, usually of its teeth, usually at about 20, usually its infants having about a 9, 10, 2% chance of living though. You can, I don't have to draw your picture. Watch as this with indifference. Thousands and thousands of generations, miserable, illiterate, starving, hungry, uh, to say nothing of the wars they'll fight with each other to say nothing of the cruelties they will inflict, as well as the ones they will suffer just from existence. And only uh, three or four, perhaps 5,000 years ago, heaven decides this is enough of that. It's time for an intervention. And the best way to do it would be in the most primitive part of the Middle East, not in China where people can read and, and have, have looked at telescopes. No, in the most primitive part of the Middle East, basically by offering human sacrifice to them. This is a doctrine that cannot be believed by anyone who studied anything scientific, anything historical, anything archaeological, anything paleological, anything biological. It can't be believed by anyone. It can't be only believed by someone who wants to be a plaything and a slave of a pitiless totalitarian power. How glad we should be that the evidence for this ghastly entity is nil. Good. Thanks. So, <clears throat> I likewise have one other thing to play for you. I do not have video on this, uh, but I have uh, audio. This was a debate that took place uh, only a matter of months ago. There we go. And uh, it was between uh, Dr. Dembski and uh, Christopher Hitchens. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to... And what I'm going to play for you. Now, Dr. Dembski started off 
pretty well. In the sense that he stayed on his strength, the issue of intelligent design, the evidence of intelligent design in the universe of which there is much. Um, but unfortunately, um, Christopher Hitchens is a very smart man. And Hitchens decided to change the rules of the debate. And rather than sticking with the format they had agreed to, uh, Hitchens is like, well, you know, I don't need my time. Let's go to questions. But then once the questions start, he actually turns into cross-examination. And once he's got cross-examination going, now he's in control. He can get to determine what the subject is. So he can get off of the subjects that are not his strength and onto the subjects he knows are not Dr. Dembski's strengths, which is theology. And now it is Hitchens' rhetoric versus Dembski, who is now off his notes. The result was uh, not good, not, not good at all. And nowhere is that seen more clearly than in the concluding statements. Because Dr. Dembski insisted on giving his closing statement. Hitchens was like, let's just take more questions. I'm ready to go. And since Dembski insisted on doing his closing statement, that means Hitchens gets to go after him. He gets the last word. Bad move all along. Hitchens just took over along those lines. Now, I do not understand, I do not pretend to understand why Dr. Dembski gave the closing statement that he did. But I think you will gain an insight into the essence of the mind of Christopher Hitchens and the new atheism as you listen to his closing statement. Now, this is in the context of a, if I recall, junior high and high school audience. Not sure who set that up, but anyway, uh, this is a junior high, high school audience they've done this debate in, and they don't have anything to look at, but we will listen. I see that the, the old Christopher Hitchens seems back in, in fighting form, so this is, this is good. Uh, Got to keep things interesting. Okay, well, let me uh, give you my closing statement. Uh, in Alexander Schmemann's critique of secularism, he remarked, quote, it is not the immorality of the crimes of man that reveal him as a fallen being. It is his positive ideal, religious or secular, and his satisfaction with this ideal. Let me read that again. It is not the immorality of the crimes of man that reveal him as a fallen being. It is his positive ideal, religious or secular, and his satisfaction with this ideal, close quote. A common criminal knows that he is a criminal and doesn't try to rationalize his crimes or cast himself as a benefactor of humanity. But an ideologue who knows what's best for humanity and cannot find satisfaction until everyone is on board with his positive ideal, with his ideology, such a man can rationalize anything and is truly dangerous. Schmemann's insight captures what's right and what's wrong with Christopher Hitchens' case against religion. Religion can be a problem, yes. Religious people confident that theirs is the only way to build a better world have felt it their moral duty to coerce, torture, and kill others. Hitchens sees this clearly, but secularism can be as guilty as religion in this respect. Secularists confident that theirs is the only way to build a better world have likewise felt it their moral duty to coerce, torture, and kill others. Nevertheless, Hitchens refuses to admit any parity between religious and secular evil. Recount atrocities committed by religious people and Hitchens is delighted, yet another nail in the coffin of religion. But mention a person, community, or movement whose atrocities flow from their secular ideals and Hitchens changes the subject. And to what subject does he change it? Why, to religion, of course. For instance, mention Stalin and the millions he killed and Hitchens will tell you how Stalin started out as a seminarian for the Orthodox priesthood and how Russian Orthodox believers presently make icons of Stalin, complete with halos. Mention the Nazis, the Holocaust, and Hitler. Hitler, by the way, likened Christianity to smallpox. And Hitchens will regale you with how many SS were churchgoers. Mention North Korea and its crazy communist dictators. And Hitchens will inform you that the North Korea is the closest thing he can imagine to the Christian heaven, complete with a holy trinity, 
compli comprising Kim this, Kim that, and Kim something else. Uh, changing the subject in this way, however, doesn't change the fact that secularism can be just as ideologically driven as religion. The irony is that Hitchens' own atheist crusade is itself ideologically driven. The subtitle of Hitchens' book reads, How Religion Poisons Everything. Gripped by the idea that religion poisons everything, he cannot allow that religious people, precisely because of their religion, might do good. Hitchens takes this idea to ridiculous extremes in his attack on Mother Teresa. In his 1994 BBC documentary, Hell's Angel, his 1995 book, The Missionary Position, and briefly, in God is Not Great, Hitchens portrays her as a self-serving hypocrite. In the audience today is my good friend Mary Poplin, a professor at Claremont. She was in Calcutta with Mother Teresa when Hitchens came out with his book against her. Recently, Poplin published Finding Calcutta, in which she recounts her time with Mother Teresa. Poplin writes, quote, and Poplin and the nuns there were reading your, your book while she was there. Hitchens also accused Mother Teresa of receiving the best in health care when it was not available to the poor. However, I took an offer to her from a colleague's brother who was involved in developing a new pacemaker to replace her old pacemaker with new, a new and improved one. She said she could not accept it, but she would accept it for the poor. She also refused another medical offer. When I called and repeated these offers upon her becoming more ill a few months after I left, and that was close to her death, she again refused and asked for prayers instead. My impression is that she mostly received good health care when she was too ill to fight it. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it there rather abruptly. I think in my rhetoric course, I, I would wrap things up. But um, uh, I'm going to give Mother Teresa the last word. So that's where I'll leave it. Oh, well. Well, Mother Teresa was a fanatic, um, a fundamentalist, and a fraud. She was not a friend of the poor, as she claimed to be. She was a friend of poverty. Preached it as a, as a good thing, as a gift from God, something to be welcomed along with other kinds of suffering. Wasn't interested in alleviating it. Was a friend of the rich. Took money from the Duvalier family in Haiti, one of the most obscenely bloated uh, dynastic dictatorships in history. Uh, took money from Charles Keating, the man who robbed Americans blind through the Lincoln Savings and Loan. Stolen money. Um, all to build convents in her own name. Uh, more than 200 of them around the world in order to found an order that bear, bore her name. This is not modesty either, nor is it humility. It doesn't exhaust my critique of her either. Um, we all know there is a cure for poverty. It's a rudimentary one. It does work, though. It works everywhere for the same reason. It's colloquially called the empowerment of women. It's the only thing that does work. If you allow women control over, some control over their cycle of reproduction, so that they're not chained by their husbands or by village custom to annual animal type pregnancies, early death, disease, and so on. If you will free them from that, give them some basic uh, health of that sort, and if you're generous enough to throw in perhaps a handful of seeds and a bit of credit, the whole floor, culturally, socially, medically, uh, economic of that village will rise. It works every time. Mother Teresa spent her entire life campaigning against that outcome. She said that contraception was equivalent to abortion morally, and abortion was morally equivalent to murder. She was entirely against the only thing that cures poverty. I would say that her preachments led to an enormous increase in the amount of poverty, ignorance, filth, and disease in the world. And I would further add, without embarrassment, that it's off those things that the Roman Catholic Church has always fed and made its living. Otherwise, there'd be no need for the Protestant Revolution, which brings us here today. Um, and believe me, I've, I've barely started with, uh, with that terrible person. Now, as I said before, you can be an atheist in anything you like. You can be an atheist in the Marquis de Sade. You can be an atheist and be uh, a great humanist. I mean, most of the uh, missionary work People work done by Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, by Oxfam, by many other people in the stricken parts of the globe which I've visited, done by people who are not doing it to proselytize for their faith. 
They're not doing it handing out Bibles surreptitiously. They're not doing it for any, for any such reason. They're doing it for its own sake. That's a, that's a beautiful humanism, and I admire it. I even think it has a slight superiority, and there's no hidden agenda to it. But I'm not going to have Nazism called secularism, if you don't mind. Uh, it's, I'm a prisoner of what I know here. I know too much about it. I've read Mein Kampf, for example, which most people have not, where Hitler says several times, starting very early on, that he's doing God's work in exterminating the Jews. He went on saying that. The Vatican was shown the book. In those days, they would ban any book they didn't like the look of. They were one of the great book banning organizations in the world. They didn't ban the book that was written by the leader who made his first political treaty in Germany with them and their church and outside Germany between his dictatorship and the Vatican. If you wanted to take your oath, well, you didn't have to want to, you had to if you were in the German army on the SS, to take your oath to the Führer, which was compulsory, you took it like this, I swear by almighty God, undying fealty. Around your belt, if you were a soldier in the Nazi army, you had to wear a buckle that said, Gott mit uns, the German for God, on our side. Uh, like every other form of totalitarianism and fanaticism, this is religious in itself, and it was not, it was not as it was in some other countries, the Christian right in power, but it was the Christian right subsumed into a party that involved various other terrible mutations too. So I just have to defend myself, it seems to me, on these two uh, matters. I'll close on the implied question that uh, Bill asked me earlier. Why don't you accept this wonderful offer? <clears throat> Why wouldn't you like to meet Shakespeare, for example? I mean, I don't know if you really think that when you die you can be corporeally reassembled and have conversations with authors from previous epochs. It's not necessary that you believe that in Christian theology, and I have to say it sounds like a complete fairy tale to me. The only reason I want to meet Shakespeare, or might even want to, is because I can meet him any time, because he is immortal in the works he's left behind. If you've read those, meeting the author would almost certainly be a disappointment. But when Socrates was sentenced to death for his philosophical investigations and for blasphemy, for challenging the gods of the city, and he accepted his death. He did say, well, if we are lucky, perhaps I'll be able to hold conversation with other great thinkers and philosophers and doubters too. In other words, that the discussion about what is good, what is beautiful, what is noble, what is pure and what is true could always go on. Why is that important? Why would I like to do that? Because that's the only conversation worth having. And whether it goes on or not after I die, I don't know. But I do know that it's the conversation I want to have while I'm still alive. Which means that to me, the offer of certainty, the offer of complete security, the offer of an impermeable faith that can't give way, is an offer of something not worth having. I want to live my life taking the risk all the time that I don't know anything like enough yet, that I haven't understood enough, that I can't know enough, that I'm always hungrily operating on the, on the margins of, of a potentially great harvest of future knowledge and wisdom. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'd urge you to look at those of you who tell you, those people who tell you at your age that you're dead till you believe as they do. What a terrible thing to be telling to children. And that you can only live. <laughs> and that you can only live by accepting an absolute authority. Don't think of that as a gift. Think of, it as a, think of it as a poison chalice. Push it aside, however tempting it is. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Thank you. So, um, who gave the more compelling closing statement? Yeah. Um, I, I, did, I didn't... Maybe there had been some agreement that because this person was in the audience, there was going to be some mention of Mother Teresa. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm left stuttering at, at, at that type of thing. But the point is you don't leave this guy with the last word anyways, and he is going to make that kind of argumentation. Now, as we listen to what he was saying to Frank Turek, what were some of the arguments? Out of all these gods, how dare you think you got the right one? 
let's set it. What's set? What's set a very straightforward accusation of hubris on your part, arrogance. Who are you to think God has revealed himself to you and not to all these other millions of people? How do you respond to that? My response to him basically would be, who are you to think that God cannot reveal himself in any way he sees fit and that he has not done so in the person of Jesus Christ? Who are you to say, if God were to reveal himself, your argument would, would shut up God. It would gag God, to use D.A. Carson's book as a title. Not the same purpose, but if the whole, the whole question is, has God spoken? You're assuming he has not. And if he has, your argument would make it impossible for anyone to affirm that he has. I like to point out that our insatiable desire to communicate, often seen in the junior high school classroom at church, um, you, know, you, know, you know the junior high period. That's where people are born human and they become subhuman for a few years and about junior year they come back out into the humanity. In that point in between, they're just, I don't think they're really human personally, but um, there is this just insatiable desire to communicate. We want to talk. We consider uh, deafness or blindness or dumbness to be a, a terrible thing. Why? Because we want to be able to communicate. We wouldn't think those things were all that bad if there wasn't this incredible desire to communicate. Where'd that come from? I mean, there are vast uh, elements of the animal world that could care less. The only reason they communicate is just simply to promote themselves uh, or their own survival if they communicate at all on a very limited level. Why do we have this ability? Why, why is there a Shakespeare amongst humans? There is no Shakespeare amongst the simians or the whales or anything like that. Why is that? Where did that come from? If there is a God who created us and gave us this ability, doesn't he have that ability? And if he communicates, then doesn't he get to choose how he communicates? So if he had communicated, given your argument, how can anybody ever know? Because you're making it as if, well, this is your God, as if, you have a different God than I do, and you have a different God than I do. And you, no, we don't. We're not making these gods up for, oh, but you have differences of opinion. That, that means we have different gods? Really? Seriously? I mean, no one ever, no, I don't know if it's the British accent or what, but no one ever comes back at him like this and says, do you, are you thinking about what it is you're actually saying? Because they're really not good arguments if you would just engage him on them. I don't know if he just makes sure that there isn't going to be that kind of uh, engagement. Common atheist argument, the new atheists and the old atheists. You are an atheist. Remember, here's everyone in this room is an atheist because every one of you can name a god you don't believe in. You reject 99 out of 100 gods. I just go one more. <coughs> What's the problem with that argument? What's the problem with that argument? You need to understand what the problem is. Dan Barker uses that argument all the time. He says, look, we're all atheists. You all reject nine out of you. You reject Thor. Anybody here worship Thor? Anybody here worship Woden? Those, you know, Thor's day, Woden's day, Sunday, the sun. You know, uh, why, why, why? There used to be people who worshipped all those gods. They don't anymore. You agree that we are right to have stopped worshiping those gods. Why am I not right to say we should stop worshiping the last god as well? It assumes all those gods are the same kind. Exactly right. Exactly right. And you can't let them have that ground. You can't let them objectify God and make him the equal to Woden or Thor. That should be the first thing that pops in your mind. Is Wait a minute, excuse me. My God is the ground of all being. Those gods didn't even claim that. Those gods came out of the creation. You are mixing apples and oranges here. And they know that. There's, there's one wonderful thing about being an atheist debater. You are not constricted by honesty. <laughs> uh, you, you don't have to worry about integrity, consistency, any of those things. Those are moral things you don't have to worry about. Uh, it, is, it is interesting. Um, Christopher Hitchens 
complains that the Christian heaven is a celestial North Korea where even thought crime is punished. Now, we all have pretty negative feelings about North Korea, as well we should. I mean, the people there suffer greatly, and you have fanatical, probably insane leadership uh, developing nuclear weapons. It's a lovely situation, very similar to Iran in uh, another, another way. Um, but what were the, what were the terms that, that Hitchens used? Servility. You want to be an abject slave. This is where his true hatred begins to come out. He detests the idea of a sovereign God and that he is a creature. He detests that his thoughts and the, the attitudes of his heart could ever be judged. And you know what? If I was an unregenerate man, I think I'd detest that too. I mean, seriously. At least Christopher Hitchens is honest. You know, I, I find Hitchens refreshing at that point. The religious liberal who tips his hat toward the idea of a god but, but really is a functional atheist is significantly more difficult to deal with, in my opinion, than a Christopher Hitcherian uh, atheist. At least it's out there. It's open. But, of course, I would respond to him if I ever had that opportunity by saying, I, I fully understand why you, as the creature of God, who spits in his face and hates him with the entirety of your heart, why you would not want to have a God who knows you that intimately. But what makes you think that someone who has been cleansed of that rebellion through the perfect provision of Jesus Christ would not want to have that kind of close, intimate fellowship and companionship with his God. Now, he hates the atonement. Oh, he just detests the atonement. He, he's never represented it correctly. He, he always misrepresents it. But you know what the sad thing is? He almost always debates people who don't have a biblical doctrine of the atonement to begin with and hence can never correct it. I've got a sermon going on there, but I'll skip it. Um, create us sick and order us to be well. Create us sick and order us to be well. It, that's his, I, I've heard that line a minimum of a dozen different times from Christopher Hitchens in a dozen, di dozen different places, debating Dinesh D'Souza or whoever it might be. He creates us sick and orders us to be well. How would you respond to that? Because we believe in original sin. We believe that we are the fallen sons and daughters of Adam. So how do you respond to that? Is, is God being unjust? Has he created us sick and ordered us to be well? Well, sickness and wellness are really not, the, I think, the best categories for that, obviously. And unfortunately, what is missing is the fact that what's the... What's the, the presupposition as to the human being in that phrase, in, in, that, in that argument? Create us sick and order us to be well. The fact that we love our sin and engage in it willfully, and in fact, outside of that sovereign change of the heart, would always continue to do so, is completely skipped. And the fact that not only is God was man created upright, but the whole concept of, of federal headship, obviously he has, has no interest in that whatsoever. Doesn't even want to, want to enter into that. So skips the reality of man's love of his own sin. Skips the reality of the fact that outside of taking out that heart of stone, giving his heart of flesh, we'll always go down that, that path and we'll continue to do so. Uh, but the idea of creating a sick misses the perfection of the creation initially. And then there's nowhere in his, he's as bad as a Muslim and just simply dismissing as a possibility the fact that the ultimate purpose of everything God is doing is to demonstrate his own glory. I think one of the most important aspects of theology to grab hold of is the fact that God desires 
to demonstrate the full range of his attributes in his creation. If God only wanted to demonstrate his wrath and his holiness, you wouldn't need redemption. If God only wanted to demonstrate his love, then you wouldn't have need, needed the fall. But if he wants to demonstrate all that he is, then he has chosen to do so in such a way that all of his attributes can be demonstrated. I mean, think about it. If God saves no one, then you never see his mercy. If he saves everyone, you never see his justice. In only one scenario is God free to act and to demonstrate all of his attributes in the saving of a people who is not everybody. So I would respond somewhere along those lines. Um, be also prepared in the New Atheist for this. I didn't play the whole thing, so you might not be familiar with it, but when he was talking about the burning bush and the bronze, bronze Age Palestine and, and all the rest of the stuff, what he was talking about was the, the glory of contemplating the, the, the edge of a singularity, of a black hole, and how if you're right on the edge of the singularity, you could see past, present, and future at the same time, and you know, all this theoretical physics stuff, which admittedly is interesting stuff. And from a Christian perspective, the more we learn about this, it's just the more, wow, God is awesome. I mean, we can go either direction to the grandeur of the massive extent of space that none of us can even begin to imagine. Billions of galaxies. We can't even imagine the size of our own galaxy, let alone billions of galaxies. Or we can go the other direction and start thinking about the, the microscopic level and the incredible intricacy of life in the cell and things. We can go both directions and we see evidence of God in both. But what he does is he contrasts that with the burning bush. You know, to which I say, well, excuse me, but you may not think a burning bush is overly special, but... This is the creator of that singularity condescending to communicate with man to begin a process whereby he is going to patiently craft a people through which he himself is going to enter into his own creation so as to provide the perfect means of salvation, not your human sacrifice foolishness, but entering into his own creation himself in the person of his son so that he might unite a people to him and not just provide for their salvation, it's not just them, but to glorify himself in the salvation of, a, of an undeserving people. So that burning bush, you're just looking at it as if it's some type of physical mythology. You've taken it out of the context in which it was presented. That's what he presented. But here's what I asked you to respond to. Here's his argument, and I cut it down just a little bit. But he goes through the age of humanity. And he says, well, you know, we've been around for 250,000 years or 100,000 years. In this one, he went as low as 75,000 years. All right, 75,000 years, man's been muddling along on this rock dying of tooth decay and um, even in the modern times, there were, there were times in the medieval period a woman would have to have 10 children to expect one to live to maturity. Infant mortality rates were so high. I mean, think about the Black Death in, in, uh, in Europe. Sweeps through and a third of Europe's gone. Um, and so he, he talks about living, you know, life expectancies during those periods of 20 years at best. And then he always does the same thing. You saw it on the video. What does he do? He crosses his arms. And he says, and what does heaven do? It watches. Just, just watches. Until how long ago? 5,000 years ago? Depending on which religion you're talking about. And after 
in this scenario, after 70,000 years of suffering and degradation, heaven finally intervenes. And according to you Christians, with what? A human sacrifice in the armpit of the world. Not even in China where they have telescopes and can write. But in the backwaters of Jerusalem. The slum of the world. And you call this something you're inviting me to? Pretty effective rhetoric. How do you respond to it? This is the, this is where you have to think through things part. How do you respond to it? For most Christians, you just go, well, well, Jesus is a nice guy. And I'm glad he died for me. That, okay, but that's not responding to what he said. Did heaven sit back and watch? I mean, you can argue time frames if you want. But there are just so many false assumptions in that argument that you have to challenge from the very start. And unfortunately, a lot of evangelicals would really struggle to challenge. What do I mean? What's the most fundamental response you'd have to offer to that? Is that as it is presented, heaven sits back and watches. Well, isn't there something in Genesis 15? After God makes his covenant with Abraham. Remember what's right at the end of Genesis 15? We just read this at our church. I imagine at your church too. We, we read through the New Testament in the morning and the Old Testament in the evening. And uh, we just started Genesis again. Uh, we tried to figure out how many years it took us to get through all of that. We sort of lost count, but it's a long time. And I, re- I, I normally do the Sunday morning reading when I'm there. Right at the end of Genesis 15, there is this cryptic statement that is made that's always struck me. God is telling Abram, he's prophesying about what's going to happen when the children of Israel go down to Egypt. And, and he says this strange thing, for the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. Remember that? I think a lot of people just go boop, 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 past that and you know, there's other important stuff to look at. The iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. Have you thought about the Amorites? When was the last time you considered the Amorites? I've considered the Amorites a lot. Who were the prophets to the Amorites? I don't know of any. I, I don't remember anything I, I, there's nothing in the text that says that God moved any of the children of Abraham in Egypt to go up to the Amorites and prophesy their destruction. In fact, it seems that these are some of the favorite people of the new atheists. That Christopher Hitchens loves the Amorites. You know why Christopher Hitchens loves the Amorites? Because they're an example of what he calls genocide ordered by God. And, oh, that's really effective as a debating technique. Convict the Christian God of of being a genocidal maniac, which is what they accuse him of. That's what Dawkins does. If you've read uh, Dawkins' God Delusion, if you read God is Not Great, if you read Sam Harris, if you read all these, the the prophets, the, the four horsemen of the new atheism, along with Daniel Dennett, uh, they present the God of the Old Testament as a genocidal maniac. And the Amorites are their primary example. Because when the people come into the land, what are they told? Wipe them out, man, woman, and child. Well, you can do what the liberals do and say, oh, it's just, uh, just a parable. Never really happened. 
Or, well, that's the evil, that's the unloving God of the Old Testament, not the loving God of the New. But none of those are options for us, even if we were silly enough to take them. We actually believe the whole Scripture. So how do you respond to it? Well, there is value in recognizing archaeologically how grossly depraved the Amorites became. We do know that, by the way. Child sacrifice and every form of sexual perversion. I think there's, there's, there's a place for a recognition of the fact that in essence, the Amorites were a picture of what happens when God goes, takes his hand off, restraint's gone, sends no prophets. And that phrase in Genesis seems to indicate God was waiting for the time when their iniquity would be full. It's come to completion. And punishment falls. So in essence, I would ask Christopher Hitchens a couple things. First of all, I'd say, well, Mr. Hitchens, we Christians happen to believe that God has had a purpose from the first moment he said, let there be light. He wasn't standing back watching anything. As the sovereign king, he had a purpose in everything he was doing. Even during those periods of time when the Amorites were sacrificing their children, God was demonstrating what happens when he takes his hand off. And hence the justice of the punishment he brought by the people of Israel. That doesn't make the people of Israel sin, sinless. The people of Israel were, his, were the tool in his hand, just as the Assyrians, pagans that they were, were the tool in God's hands in Isaiah chapter 10 to punish his own people. They were means. But you see... Mr. Hitchens, just because you are blind to the purposes that God has laid out, to the demonstration of the fact that man is a sinful creature, and even when he's left alone and doesn't have any crazy religious people being sent to them, what do they do? They stew in their rebellion and their hatred for his law. God wasn't sitting up there for 70,000 years or whatever period of time you want to argue about just observing, and then going, oh, I think I'll do this. From the very beginning, if you will allow the text you hate so much to speak, Christ is described as the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. God had a purpose in all of it. You may not know what it is, and it's funny, when you talk about your knowledge of the world, you don't mind saying you don't know. But when it comes to God's knowledge of things, for somehow you know what God can and cannot do and what God can and cannot know. That's interesting. How can you do that? But when God chose to act, God chose to act at the very beginning, not 5,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. What you don't see is the drama that is the entirety of written scripture from beginning to end of God's revelation of himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You just miss that. You cut up into pieces and go, well, I don't see any purpose. Heaven wasn't sitting back watching. Heaven was accomplishing exactly what heaven had intended to accomplish from eternity past. Now, you might find Israel to be the backwaters of the world. But that's because you seem to be very impressed with uh, man's inventions and technology and literature and anything else. But instead, God was demonstrating that he works with people not based upon their worthiness, but upon his grace. Because if there's any demonstration of that, it's the people of Israel. They didn't deserve any of the great benefits that was given to them. It's not because they were greater than any other people or mightier than any other people. That's the exact words of Scripture. Mr. Hitchens, when you think that God's solution is a human sacrifice in the backwaters of culture and society, Sir, I have no idea what religion you're talking about. Because to see a human sacrifice is never voluntary. But the man you hate so much, Jesus, in the earliest documents that we have of anything that he said, indicated that he must go to Jerusalem, that it was necessary that he go, and that he give his life 
voluntarily. Sir, your life's going to be taken from you, either by the cancer you have or by age itself. This man could give his own life. He was different than you and me. Truly man, but you see, sir, we believe he was also truly God. And that means it was not a human sacrifice in the sense you try to use that word. It was self-sacrifice of the perfect man who gave himself, and that was the very center of history itself. And you know what, sir? You may not like the fact that it was done someplace outside of Rome or Peking or some great place of culture. That's exactly what the Bible says you're going to think. Because God has chosen to use the weak things of this world, the foolish things of this world to confound the mighty. Because God in his wisdom has determined that you will never know him by yours. But I don't get to debate him, so I don't get to say those things. But maybe one of you will get that opportunity. I don't know. But those would be some of the things that I would say to Christopher Hitchens. I forgot to ask you how you would respond. I apologize. I started preaching that sermon a little bit too early. But I've heard him use it so many times, and to be honest with you, I've never heard anyone respond to it in a meaningful fashion. Because what would you have to have to respond in a meaningful fashion? You have to have a thoroughly biblical theology. And when it comes to God's sovereign decrees, man's deadness and sin, the specific nature of the atoning sacrifice of Christ and its perfection, are those not the very areas that so much of evangelical theology falls flat in? It is our theology that determines our apologetic response. That's the way it must flow. All right? Okay, we have about five minutes for questions, if there are any. I spoke about, you know, um, morality. It's, it's a consensus issue, but he will say, his response is to say, are you seriously telling me that up until the point where Moses climbed up upon a hill, um, that man did not know that murder was wrong? Now, that's not an answer because the Christian response is man knew that murder was wrong because God, as his creator, gave him that conscience. His, his response is, well, we developed that evolutionarily. There are, there are evolutionary biologists that will explain the necessity of this. Read Richard Dawkins, The Self as Gene. And he falls back on this rather vague idea that the reason we, we shouldn't just have tooth and claw and just get your genes out there and, and kill everybody else to get your, your genotype predominant is because we have uh, developed an es a, a sense of community. Well, tell that to the warring hordes you know, uh, of, of humanity that has wiped out other communities. I, I don't buy it, but it, it sounds real nice. And he, doesn't, he rarely gets pressed on it. He rarely gets pressed on it. Um, I might, if I can, I'm not sure I can, but that really came up in a debate I did in August with the Vice President of American Atheists. I really pressed him on that issue because the thesis of the debate was, is the New Testament evil? That was supposed to be what I was going to debate with Hitchens because he has a chapter in his book, The Evil of the New Testament. That's why we did it. The other guy took over, and I really pressed him on that, on that issue. And I got him to basically say that if he and I stood together at the gates of Auschwitz today, or Buchenwald, and looked at those gas chambers, the best he could say is, I don't think that was proper. That's the best he could say. Because you see, evil, good, is all a consensus at the particular point in time. Totally. And he, he admitted it. He admitted it. At least he was honest enough to admit it. I'll give him that. Anyone else? Clear as mud, huh? Mickey was wondering if you could play that John Denver 
We'll leave that one up there. Yeah, I was. That's the only thing he's talked about since you opened that thing up. At the bottom, remembering John Denver was there. <laughs> Where do, oh, there. Okay. D, d, oh, okay. I, I, I know what you're. I know what you're talking about. But I'm just sort of feeling a little sad here that, you know, I did all this effort um, to show you these things, and all you can remember is remembering John Denver. Um, this is actually a really, really, really good uh, thing because I happen to really. Like John Denver's music and the uh, arc of his career was like that of an eagle taking flight. There you go. Okay. So anyway, any serious questions other than Richard Brasellas? Yes, sir. Well, I find it interesting. I mean, because it's clear that he has a strong sense of morality yes, in, yeah. in whatever sense. But which he knows he's violating, interestingly enough. Does Does he realize that? Yes. Oh, there's no question about it. There's no, I've had people tell me that. Um, <coughs> when they were shooting the Doug Wilson thing, he was naturally attracted to hang around the Christians, but he'd just sort of sit on the periphery and listen to them talk, drinking. Normally, that stuff in his, his plastic cup is not water. Um, he, he, he drinks heavily. Um, but there was something about them that, that attracted him. It really did. Um, and so... He's a tortured man. I, I cannot, despite how nasty he can become, I, I cannot hate that man. I, I mean, I, I, I truly pray that God will use this, this situation to, to break his heart, but he, he's been exposed to so much compromise. I can only hope that he's been exposed to enough truth, you know, uh, that, that he, he knows what it is. I don't know. I don't know. I was looking forward to meeting him. I really was. I'm sorry? Oh, thank you. Um, did Doug Wilson give a meaningful answer to Hitchens in his debates? Would that DVD be instructive? After all, Wilson is a presuppositionalist, isn't he? Um, then he mentions Wilson versus Dan Barker. I would highly recommend Doug Wilson's debate with Dan Barker. I benefited a lot from it, and, uh, and I really enjoyed Doug's humor in that one. There is one point where... Uh, something about the Hebrew language came up, and Dan was making a completely invalid point, and I agree with Doug at this point. And Dan said something along the lines of, uh, uh, "Well, you know, that was what the Hebrew said." And uh, Doug's response was, "Yeah, well, do you think Moses knew Hebrew?" <laughs> and the, the whole audience started cracking up. It was it was really hilarious, but it, you'd have to have been there to see it, I guess. Anyway, um, the question is about uh, the movie. Um, Collision, thank you. I was going eclipse. I'm going for eclipse. What's <laughs> that come from? Obviously, 10 o'clock. Um, the movie Collision, it, it, was, it was interesting. It, it was designed for a young audience, which leaves me out. It, it's, it's, it, it's very artsy. It's not a debate. It is segments of their interactions at various places, portions of televised debates, and it, it's sort of hard to follow. And uh, once Doug got a little bit too earthy from my perspective, but uh, th there was, if, if you've listened to the formal debates, it's interesting as a collage, almost as an entertainment thing. Obviously, from my perspective, um, there's still so much more that I would want to see Hitchens challenged on than Doug did in that. But there's no question in my mind that of all the people he's debated, at least Doug Wilson has raised the right questions with him. Um, and it was interesting to note some of the things that, that uh, Hitchens said toward the end of the, of the encounter. That seemed, it, it was interesting that when he debated William Lane Craig at Biola, he immediately recognized that Craig was an evidentialist and criticized him for that from a presuppositional perspective because he had just been spending so much time with Doug Wilson. So he understands the differences. And, and I think on one level, he sort of respects those who, who take that position. But, I, but still, I've heard him even caricature Wilson's position. So I would have handled things differently, but uh, 
uh, it's, it's better than most, uh, let's put it that way.